So Romantic Killers is a series I kept hearing echoes of every now and again, but I kept putting off watching it. After all, I don't generally care for romance and actively dislike most meta media, so I don't know why I would watch it. Then again, procrastination is a hell of a motivator, so when there were better things I was supposed to be doing, watch it I did. And I was surprisingly on board with its approach. You see, I'm not interested in romance, I'm not against it, but I've never been in a relationship and don't really feel the urge to do so. As a whole, I do think romantic relationships are something that's good and healthy for society, however I'm skeptical of some of the assumptions and rituals society has formed around it. So I was actually really on board with the Romantic Killer's exploration of what romance is and the ideas that have formed around it. Exploring what is romance, the social norms and ideals behind it, and when those ideas are taken to the extreme and turned into obsession. After all, the premise is that you have this extremely otaku girl who doesn't want to do anything but game and think about chocolate and cats. Not the sort to ever have the time for something like romance. However, with the decline in birth rate, the government has deployed a system of wizards to try and force more people into relationships through mimicking dating sins. At least I think that's the premise. So now you have Anzu, who was originally indifferent to romance, actively against it since she doesn't like the idea of being forced into a relationship, and likes the idea of being perma-banned from her three favorite things even less. What I think really allows the meta elements to work is that it isn't too loud with it. Usually with meta, the author is so eager to show the audience that they're on board with you and they know how cliche these things are, that it takes priority over cohesive world and character building. With Romantic Killer, though Anzu is familiar with the cliches, she treats the characters as people first, and when the cliches happen, any commentary is blink and you'll miss it, rather than being overly dwelled upon. It's also super important with this premise that the show never falls victim to forced romance or drama, the thing that starts many of these tropes. Whenever the story does follow through with cliches, which isn't very often, it's always careful to make sure they fit naturally with the characters and story. You'd think this would go without saying in a deconstruction series like this, but that is a mistake I see surprisingly often, in romance deconstruction in particular. This lens of cliché also helps with the themes around exploring romance since so much of how young people understand romance is informed by the media and stories they consume, as the story shows the humanity behind the tropes and the hows and whys for them being toxic. For instance, the hot guy who girls obsess over, you see this guy all over anime, in shoujos in particular, an element of the character used for gags but not generally taken seriously. But with Katsuki, you get to see the mistrust in women that this subjectification causes, particularly when there was one woman who took things a little too far, as previously Kazuki had a stalker that made purchases in his mother's name, watched him go to school every morning, even drugged him, convinced they were in a relationship. All it took was one small normal interaction with a stranger to spark this obsession that caused a lot of personal and family strife, as the father accused Kazuki of causing the problems and leading the girl on since he was supposedly benefiting from it. And because of this, he can no longer see strangers as safe, as they all now strike him as potential dangers. He's cold to others not as an arbitrary bad boy character trait, but because he sees his stalker and all the unknown women he meets. And I feel the show does a really good job of selling the trauma and panic that this one incident caused on his psyche. It also doesn't present this as some sort of like male-only issue, as we get to see the flip side position with Anzu's best friend in her flashback, with Saki feeling pushed into a relationship with an older schoolmate, and despite doing her best to be upfront while still keeping people happy, she gets slandered and accused of leading him on when he tried to assault her. And despite the scrutiny, the show doesn't use the premise to just shit on romance. It shows that obsessions of any sort are bad, like how completely oblivious Anzu was because of her otaku obsession not even remembering Junta's real identity, and how it was only after this that she came to appreciate real quality time with others and proper conduct in society, such as fashionable dressing. Essentially, even if this program isn't teaching her to fall in love, it is teaching her to become an active member of society, which is a good change. It also shows the feelings and relationships developed through the main cast as healthy and positive influences. 
Now, the biggest issue I had with the show was that I feel like there was some dissonance going on between how the show wanted me to view some characters' actions and how they actually came off to me. Particularly, and please forgive me using this term, with a lot of the girl boss moments. Anzu was the most common instigator of this problem, however I feel like the most prominent example for me was actually a scene with Saki. So there's this one particular flashback where a classmate asks her what her boob size is, and she responds with, how big is your dick? Now, I could see a middle schooler being taken aback by this and getting embarrassed. So I don't have a problem with the flashback itself. However, based on the present day character reactions, it's clear the viewer is supposed to see this as a super cool Yagata moment, like a super savage burn. But it really isn't. The ideas behind the two statements don't even line up. The whole point of the asking what size her tits are is because they are visually large, it's sexualizing her, however still presenting her as sexually desirable. This sort of thing isn't necessarily harmful in a vacuum, but it is a societal problem because of the regularity with which such events happen, as well as the fact that the individuals receiving it don't desire such treatment. So using what size is your penis isn't the gender reversing god on the show seems to think because of the social dynamics around it. If these statements are supposed to correlate, then the friend would be implying he has a large penis, which clearly isn't what she wanted to do and also wouldn't be perceived as a negative thing, as an extremely horny male who is already in a sexual state of mind isn't likely to take issue with being sexualized by the object of his interest. In isolation, I wouldn't take issue with one questionable execution, but there are several of these moments where the show treats something the women do as cooler, more impressive than I feel is appropriate, which is bed for immersion. Now, this might not seem like it would have an effect on the themes of romance, and I suppose for many it might not, but personally I think that outside of the breaking immersion, these moments seem more interested in momentary gotums than properly examining the ideas they're exploring. For instance, the scene above is probably trying to poke at gender inequality with sexual harassment. However, if a guy watches it and walks away thinking about how dumb her comeback is, it's not going to get the point across very well. I wouldn't say that the problem is too big though, as there were more than enough interesting elements to overshadow those distracting ones. I'd love to hear y'all's thoughts on the ideas of romance and love below. After all, I'm not a participant, just an observer. I'd love to hear any other thoughts too. Otherwise, that'll be all. Bye.